New Hampshire, home to roughly 1,000 freshwater lakes and ponds and 12,000 miles of rivers and streams. These precious waterways are essential to the health and prosperity of the region, providing a necessary natural resource that serves not only New Hampshire's recreational needs, but its economic and ecological needs as well. Lakes are important to the land around them. They help control river flows and prevent flooding. They provide food and shelter for animals and replenish the groundwater. They're also perfect for recreation and relaxation. Lakes are where we go to swim and play, to boat and to fish. They're also where we work and live, where many of us get our drinking water and are an essential part of the economy of communities built around them. New Hampshire's lakes attract thousands of visitors each year, providing approximately 17,000 full and part-time jobs and generating roughly $400 million of the annual household income. Lakes are good for our souls. They're where we can go to connect with our family, friends, and community. They provide a chance to get away from the daily grind, an opportunity to explore and enjoy nature. But sometimes in our eagerness to enjoy our lakes, negative consequences occur. One of those consequences are infestations of invasive non-native plant and animal life, collectively known as aquatic invasive species. First discovered in the 1960s, these hitchhikers can cause huge problems for lakes and their surrounding communities. Invasive aquatic species have been a problem in New Hampshire since 1965, when we first documented variable milfoil in Lake Winnipesaukee. From there, they branched out to other water bodies with variable milfoil for a number of years being the primary species. Then we had fanwort come into the state in a few water bodies and water chestnut, curly leaf pond weed, and a number of other species over the years. To date, we have 14 different species of invasive aquatic plants in the state. And unfortunately, more recently, we started finding invasive aquatic animals in our water bodies with the Asian clam in four water bodies in the state to date. The presence of aquatic invasive species alters the natural ecology of waters, choking out native plant and animal life by creating dense mats of weeds that are all but impossible to break through and forcing fierce competition for the limited food supply. Boating through or simply breaking off a piece of an invasive plant can cause new infestation to take root. Every weed fragment is a potential plant for new growth. These dense weeds make boating an inconvenience at best, impossible at worst, and pose a serious risk of drowning to swimmers who might get entangled in their vines. Each invasive animal species can cause damage and frustrate lake enthusiasts in their own unique ways, clinging to boat hulls, machinery, and fishing equipment, clogging the works, and even in some extreme cases, causing boats to sink under their collective weight. Meanwhile, on the lake bed, the razor-sharp shells of the zebra mussel have made going in the water barefoot a thing of the past. And the toxic algae blooms that can result from some of these exotic pests' presence have been known to make people sick and even kill animals who drink the water. Managing the growth of aquatic invasive species is a near-Herculean task requiring special equipment, divers, sometimes chemicals, and year-round monitoring. Just managing aquatic invasive plant species alone costs upward of $1 million per year across New Hampshire. Some of the most popular tourism spots are also the most severely affected by aquatic invasive species infestation. High-profile examples include Lake George, New York, Lake Tahoe, California, Nevada, Lake Winnipesaukee, New Hampshire. And how do these aquatic trespassers spread? They spread when fragments of invasive plant life cling to boat props, fishing equipment, and trailers that have not been properly cleaned, drained, and dried after leaving already infested bodies of water. The plant species of highest concern are variable milfoil, Eurasian water milfoil, fanwort, hydrilla, curly leaf pondweed, and water chestnut. When we talk about invasive species spread, we tend to refer to vectors, which are different means of spread or the carriers of invasive species. The primary vector of spread in the state is the transient boater. When they go into a water body and leave with something attached, either a plant trailing off from the boat or larvae or live animals in their bait buckets or live wells or in some other compartment of the boat, they then bring it to another water body and introduce it. And this is supported by the fact that most of the time when we find new infestations, they are found at the boat launch first. Animal aquatic invasive species are very good at hitchhiking between water bodies. 
their larvae traveling in drops of lake water, trapped in boat motors and bilges and bait buckets, and more developed specimens clinging to boat hulls, props, and fishing rods. They also enter water bodies when aquarium enthusiasts dispose of materials from their home aquariums in improper ways. Animal species of highest concern include Asian clam, Chinese mystery snail, quagga mussel, spiny water flea, zebra mussel, and didymo, which while technically an algae, still acts like an animal in how it affects the environment. If you're an angler, um, one of the things you really should be thinking about, concerned about, is uh, your bait and what to do with that bait at the end of the day uh, when it's in that bait bucket, either in, in your boat or if you're ice fishing. Um, we recommend, highly recommend that you don't just dump that excess bait and water into the lake that you're fishing. Unless, of course, you trap that bait in that water body that you're currently fishing. Because um, you just never know exactly uh, where that water, and even sometimes exactly where that bait originated. As a control method, as of 2006, any projects dealing with aquatic invasive species management must come with a long-term management plan. One of the important things to remember about invasive species management in general is that it takes a lot of partners to be successful on any level, on the prevention level, on the early detection level, and on the management level. If we don't have partners involved in the whole process, we tend to see failures in any aspect, prevention, early detection, and management. So we need partners both on the state level and on the local level uh, with nonprofit groups that are very involved in the ecological aspects of protection and prevention. So maintaining that partnership or building a partnership if one doesn't exist is an important element in any invasive species plan. But management doesn't prevent new infestations from taking root. Why settle for bandaging a wound when you could prevent the injury? Prevention is the only true solution. The New Hampshire Lakes Association Lake Host Program, started in 2002, is the first line of defense against the spread of aquatic invasive species. As of 2013, New Hampshire lake hosts conducted over 500,000 boat and trailer inspections and prevented more than 1,000 potential introductions of aquatic invasive species into local waters. The New Hampshire Lakes Association was formed in 1992, and our mission is to protect the lakes of New Hampshire for current and future generations. There's about 1,000 lakes in New Hampshire that are in the public trust, and they're just the value to New Hampshire is incalculable from an economic standpoint, a recreational standpoint, just the quality of life, wildlife. Anybody who's played in and around or lived near a lake knows the value of them. So the threat of aquatic invasive species has been very real and been growing. And in 2002, the Lake Host Program was formed by New Hampshire Lakes in which we take a dedicated portion of boat registration fees and through which we're able to hire about 250 part-time seasonal employees called lake hosts and there's about 500 volunteers in addition so a total of 750 people working around the state at about a hundred boat ramps and this is through local associations local lake and watershed and beach and cove associations it's these local partnerships that make this work uh, what we do at these at, at the boat ramps or what the lake hosts do is they promote a program we call clean drain and dry when a broder comes, they're going to get information in a cordial, you know, it's a courtesy uh, uh, experience uh, for them. Uh, we welcome them to the boat ramps, provide them with information, and ultimately educate them how to clean, drain, and dry their boat between one water body and the next. The next line of defense is the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services Weed Watchers Program. According to both New Hampshire Lakes Association and New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services, when both the Lake Coast and the Weed Watchers early detection programs have been in place on a water body, no new wide-scale invasive weed infestations have occurred. This proves what hundreds of Lake Coasts all across the state have always known, prevention programs work. But these education and prevention efforts take place out on the lake, pond, or river, not in private homes. This is why the DES and Fish and Game encourage aquarium, ornamental pond enthusiasts and anglers to properly, thoroughly, and humanely dispose of unwanted plant or animal materials. New Hampshire isn't the only state to tackle the challenge of prevention. 
In Maine, aquatic invasive species prevention signs are placed at major highway and roadway entrances into the state. In Massachusetts, the prevention messages are placed in some highway billboards. Throughout New England, sticker and decal campaigns are waged in support of AIS prevention and control. The Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife requires bass clubs participating in club tournaments to conduct boat and trailer inspections as a condition of their permit. Vermont law prohibits the transport of all aquatic plants or aquatic plant parts on the outside of a vehicle, boat, personal watercraft, trailer, or other equipment. Beyond New England, both Lake Tahoe and Lake George enforce mandatory boat inspection programs, which may require boat wash stations to decontaminate vessels. All things considered, we're doing well in our efforts to control and prevent the spread of aquatic invasive species in New Hampshire, but we can do better. What else needs to be done? More stringent laws? Increased awareness? Heightened vigilance? How can we achieve these goals? Implement sustainable statewide funding mechanisms and increased volunteer efforts. Expand the Lake Host program to additional boat ramps, public, town, and state venues, and private marinas, campgrounds, homeowners associations, and on all lakes and rivers. Expand weed watcher efforts to all lakes and rivers. Expand access to boat wash stations or work with commercial wash stations to offer boat washing incentives. Expand control efforts to all infested water bodies. A recent study shows that no active management occurs on approximately 30% of the water bodies in New Hampshire infested with aquatic invasive plants. Enhance the statewide media campaign to educate the public, residents, and out-of-state visitors with the Clean, Drain, and Dry prevention message. Coordinate education and prevention efforts with other states so that boaters see the same message and the same approach as they go from state to state and lake to lake. Lakes are a beautiful and essential part of our lives, and we can't afford to let one more succumb to aquatic invasive species infestation. But by working cooperatively at the local level, through your community's lake association, and at the state level, with organizations like New Hampshire Lakes Association, the Department of Environmental Services, and New Hampshire Fish and Game, we can prevent the spread of aquatic invasive species, both plants and animals. To learn how you can help, visit the New Hampshire Lakes Association website at www.nhlakes.org or contact us by phone at 603-226-0299.